Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, 39th ECHO session, EMS ECHO trainings. And first of all, I'd like to say Happy New Year's Day. Uh, today's topic of discussion is uh, emergency management of acute abdominal pain in children. Uh, before we start, let's, I would like to have introductions. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Elias Kambale, the Regional Emergency Medical Services uh, focal person and REACT mentor for Kabale Region. I am based at Kabale Regional Referral Hospital. Um, and at this juncture, I would like to uh, ask the rest of uh, the members to introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dagile Alice, a registered nurse from Lago National Referral Hospital, Pediatric Department, Surgery Pediatric Department. And, uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nimanya Stella. I'm a pediatric surgeon that's working with the pediatric surgery unit at uh, Mulago National Barrow Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. You're welcome to this session. I'm Businje Jacob. I'm an emergency medicine resident from Barrow Regional Referral Hospital. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm Dr. Harry Chen. I'm a SEED Global Health Emergency Medicine Educator and I will be on trying to answer your questions in the chat and Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Harry. Um, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Agawa. I'm the Clinical Advisor for SEED Global Health. Uh, as we all know, SEED Global Health partners with the Ministry of Health to advance emergency medical services in the country. And one of the programs is through these ECHO sessions that you have been diligently attending, and we thank you. Thank you for being interested in improving emergency medical services in your areas. I welcome you to this session that focuses on acute abdominal pain in children, and I'm wishing you a wonderful session. Just to note, for the previous phase, certificates have been issued and we are just left with a few people about 60 of them the majority of the people who are eligible for the certificates have already received them and as a reminder we give certificates to persons that attend 75 percent of the sessions so to qualify for the certificate make sure you log on and attend at least 75 percent of the sessions thank you and i wish you a wonderful session Thank you, Dr. Agara, for that uh, piece of information. Uh, we will be going to the next uh, item, which is uh, pretest and expectations. So we'd like to know, we'd, we'd like to know your expectations for, for this uh, session. And um, also, we are going to upload a pretest, which will request you to, to answer. Thank you. And um, I think as 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 you, you you give us your expectations and answer the pretest, we shall also be uh, going to the next item. So um, I think at this, at this moment we, we, we are going to have uh, our case presenter to be ready for the presentation, Dr. Patricia Ajambo. If you're on the call, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Patricia. We can hear you. Yes, yes you uh, said you would project for me the PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, we are going to do that, but uh, please kindly introduce your, your, yourself uh, in the meantime. Okay. Um, I am Dr. Ajamo Patricia Dikana, a resident in a master's I'm doing masters in pediatrics and child health at Kaba um, University School of Medicine. And I'll be presenting uh, the case about acute abdomen that received at Kaba Regional Referral Hospital. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jambo. I'm going to project the, the presentation shortly. Meanwhile, I encourage all the participants to continue uh, doing the pretest as well as uh, sharing with us your expectations. Let's see if we have a... Uh, Did they find the pretest? Yeah, that's what's presented. Yes, um, good afternoon again, everyone. You're welcome to this session. Um, as one of the, the, the experts on this, uh, on, on this talk, I um, would expect uh, everyone who has joined to probably uh, understand what the goals of our evaluation of this child with an acute abdomen are, uh, which we shall go through and be able to understand the different um, cases that will present to us in the different emergency departments or different hospital departments where we work, that a child who comes in an acute abdomen, what, uh, what, uh, what are the different clinical cases that will present to us. Um, I think maybe to add on to what uh, Dr. Jacob has said, um, my expectation would basically be, um, I hope everyone will eventually be comfortable in just being able to generate a list of differentials for a child that's presenting to you, uh, being to appropriately work through them so that at least you can get to the right diagnosis. And at least offering some form of emergency management, even if you're going to refer the patient, or if you need to be managing the patient, being able to be comfortable in doing that for a child that's presenting to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, our dear experts. Uh, some of the expectations that we have in the chats, we have Price here. She, she's wondering why we, she expects our pretests to be marked and uh, Answers given. Also, I don't know. Also, there's a, a, an expectation or a question about how to describe how acute abdomen is different between an adult and a child. Okay. okay. Uh, please keep the expectations coming in and uh, keep answering the pretest as we prepare to put to. So, this is how the questions were answered. Um, so, for question number one, I was asking what is the typical age group in which you see intersusception. Um, majority chose uh, children between one year to five years. Because it's meant to be from one month to five years. 
And then 25% uh, chose neonics, uh, which is less than one man. And the few people, like 8%, chose between five years to 13 years. We'll see later which of those is Question number two is asking uh, the following are the nursing interventions for a child with intestinal obstruction, except 72% uh, chose uh, isolate the child to prevent the spread of infection. And, uh, we'll see later which one is right. Uh, the rest of the number is even a bit different than the others. Um, for the third question, it was asking which is the first symptom in children presenting with interception. And uh, majority chose uh, colic abdominal pain, and that was 47%. And the next most chosen was red current jelly uh, stools at uh, 32%. And then uh, the last question was asking which is the major modality of choice? In making a diagnosis of interception. And uh, the most chosen were the upper two, which was one was the uh, plain erect abdominal radiogram or x ray, and the second was an abdominal ultrasound scan. As our experts will take us through, we hope by the end of the presentation we'll have a great improvement in answers. Yeah, thank you. That's not the end of the pretest and expectations session and at this juncture i would like to welcome our case presenter dr jambo to take us through the case presentation Dr. Jambo, the, the, the slides and the screen. Dr. Patricia, please unmute. Sorry, I had not unmute. Thank you so much. Yeah, most welcome for the presentation. Yes. So I'm, I'll be presenting uh, a child whom we received at Kaba Region Faro Hospital who came in with acute abdomen. Uh, this was Casey. Yes, I'm going to have a reminder about that position. Yes, this was Casey, yeah. eight months old male who was from uh, Chikunjiri village, Mwanjari, Parish Southern Division, Kabale District, was admitted on 19th May, 2023, and um, was discharged on 23rd of May this year. Or that was on the seventh first op day. And it was a referral from um, Kamchila Health Center 4, which is uh, in Kabale District. He came in with a history of vomiting, constipation for three days, bloody diarrhea and abdominal swelling for two days, excessive crying, fever, and refusal to feed for one day. On examination, the child was very sick looking. The thagic was stayed on the mother's laps, had mild conjunctivo and palmar pala, also had severe colonicia, was febrile with a temperature of 38 0.6 degrees Celsius and had no more anthropometric uh, measurements. The air was painted and um, were had tachypnea of 38 breaths per minute with oxygen saturation of 98% in room air. And the rest of the, uh, the chest examination was normal. Had features of severe dehydration that were evidenced by sunken anterior fontanel, had uh, sunken eyes with no tears. The capillary fluid time was uh, two seconds, had um, tachycardia of 170 beats per minute with uh, uh, a, thin, a pulse of thin uh, volume, 
had a uh, blood pressure of 90 out of 55 millimeters of March, which was slightly low for his age. So at this, at this point, we managed severe dehydration and we, we uh, managed uh, to get an IV line. We started plan C, where we gave an uh, intravenous normal saline, 30 mils per kilogram body weight of the child for over one hour then uh, followed by 70 mils per kilogram body weight for the next five hours. For the next five hours was done in, uh, in, uh, in the theater as they were waiting for uh, surgery. So this child was also alert with a modified Glasgow coma scale of uh, 14 out of 15 and verbal response was well because the child had irritable cries. The rest of the other examination on a uh, uh, separate nervous system was no. normal. So because the child had not fed for the last 24 hours and was also irritable, <laughs> we thought probably this child could also have uh, hypoglycemia. We did a random blood sugar, which was seven mmos, and, and that was normal. So on exposure, the abdomen of the child was grossly distended, moving with respiration, had visible dilated loops. Uh, there was no a visible peristatic movement. He had tenderness in the right uh, area region, had a hyperresonant percussion note with no bowel sounds. The dictal rectal exam, uh, I found mucoid red current jerry uh, stool. So at this point, we inserted and there's a gastric tube, which was a uh, draining. Uh, uh, bilious gastric contents, and we drained about 150 mils, and this also helped on the uh, breathing of the child uh, improved. So after this um, emergency uh, resuscitation of the child, as we continue the resuscitation, we took a more, de de more detailed history. Uh, concerning the presenting complaint. So this child had had vomiting for about three days, which was a projectile. It was initially yellow and bilious, however, non-blood stained. It was a large volume and the child would have, uh, uh, um, would vomit about five minutes after a feeding. And this was associated with a uh, uh, constipation. So uh, also had, diarrhea, which was there for two days and could have about five episodes in 24 hours, which were small volumes and uh, there were mucoid uh, blood stained stools. So uh, one day prior to admission, following the initial presentation, the child had pop, uh, abdominal uh, swelling, which was a sudden onset, and this was associated with excessive crying, refusal to feed, and uh, fast breathing. And also the child later developed fever, which was a sudden onset, high grade, and uh, constant. And uh, this child had no history of food or drug allergy, was not on any medications. This was the index admission, and the child was not a sura, HIV sura exposed and had never been operated before. The child had had uh, the last meal, that was about tw 24 hours prior to, uh, 24 hours ago before admission. And there were no any other events around, in the, uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the, the child's uh, illness. So we did um, some investigations. Uh, as we were assessing the IV line, intravenous line, we uh, were able to uh, uh, collect blood sample. We did a uh, complete blood count and we found the hemoglobin level was 10.5 gram by this, which was a mild anemia. Uh, we found low mean capsular volume and the mean capsular hemoglobin concentration, uh, which showed the child was having uh, um, macrocytic and hypochromic anemia had neutrophilic lipocytic uh, uh, leukocytosis. Uh, he also had reactive uh, thrombocytosis, which was evidence of uh, viral and uh, bacterial infection. 
the slum, uh, the slum urea and creatinine were in normal. We also did slum um, electrolytes where the potassium levels were normal. The sodium and chloride levels were uh, low. And we also screened the child for HIV, which was negative. We did blood grouping and X and X match to book blood for uh, for uh, intraoperative use or postoperative. Uh, so after the intravenous resuscitation of uh, of uh, of resuscitation of the child, over after uh, over one hour, the child was taken for imaging, and we did an urgent ultrasound scan of, of the abdomen which uh, showed a feature suggestive of deception, and uh, specifically it showed uh, a target sign, which the experts will explain more in the subsequent uh, presentation. So our diagnosis uh, was intestinal obstruction, um, most likely due to interception uh, with severe dehydration uh, and mild hypochromic macrocytic anemia query cause most like iron deficiency since the child had severe polynic here. So our management plan was uh, uh, called for help, uh, called all the, 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 okay, called the nurses and uh, the doctors who were around uh, to to can manage the, the emergency, informed the, the surgical team. Meanwhile, we did the supportive management, which I described earlier, the ABCDE, and we gave a, uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics, we gave rectoparacetam as a painkiller and an antipyretic. So the surgical management, after the initial resuscitation over one hour and, and confirming the diagnosis and doing the supportive management, the child was uh, handed over to the surgical team, taken to theater, uh, we continued the further resuscitation from there um, and uh, a further assessment. Informed consent was obtained by the surgical team and uh, an emergency exploratory laparotomy was done. Um, your colic interception was found with viable gut, which was reduced. Uh, the child was managed postoperatively on surgical pediatric ward with no uh, complications and um, the child recovered well. And by the seventh post-operative day, the child had greatly improved and was discharged. And he's currently uh, doing well. Thank you so much for the uh, presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ajambo, for that. Uh, precise and um, wonderful presentation. And um, really that is representative of what we did at the, at the hospital. And um, thank you. Uh, maybe this is time for, except that maybe uh, when we reached, when we reached here, the operating room, the research station had to change a little bit because Despite the plan C, the patient was still severely hydrated, so we had to give the continuous pathology bolus while monitoring the urine output until the team was comfortable that the patient was had been adequately resuscitated. That's when we were able to go in for the procedure. Uh, the rest of the things. And thank you, Dr. Jambo. This is time for reactions to the case. To the case presentation and it's going to be a, a five minute session so we shall begin with the, the audience let's hear your reactions and then we shall have the reaction from the experts thank you so we have a hand from uh, jackson Kutabua. Kutabua. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you, Doc, for the presentation. This is Jackson Gutagua uh, from General Metro Hospital, Bombo. Uh, my reaction about the case is uh, about clarity. And uh, doctor's presentation, the history indicated the child had vomiting with constipation, but again, later on, we had the diarrhea. 
uh, maybe you can help us uh, uh, give us a sequential aspect of these events. It is hard for me to understand how a child with the with the constipation also has diarrhea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, maybe Dr. Dr. Patricia, if you're still there, you could do quickly and clarify on that. Yes, this child uh, initially had a, a vomiting and uh, a constipation, then later they developed diarrhea. That is how they presented. I think it is possible because in the distal, in the distal, uh, this of the obstruction, maybe there was some uh, some stool that was there that later came out, but still the, it, the stool was more of a bloody mucoid substance. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, he gets it uh, more clearly now. Any other any other reaction? Uh, maybe we can hear from our experts just briefly about the case, the, the case presentation, if there are uh, aren't any other reactions. Do you have any So there's a, what I was there have, or did. There is a hand. We have some in the chats. Yes. Yeah, there's a, a question about painkillers, rectal paracetamol, and diarrhea. IV would be ideal. That, that was a comment. Yeah. There is also another question. I think, I think we'll answer the next question in the presentations for the All experts. All right. Yeah. Cool. Dr. Dr. Isinje, you have a reaction? Yeah, um, General, not really. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ajambo, for the presentation. Um, I think it was, uh, it was, it was well, well presented, and uh, you presented to us how the, the child came to you before the operation and it's important to also note how well the patient was doing after the operation, which is a good thing as we get into the presentations, I think we shall expand further on. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sengi. Dr. Sela, any No, I, I think as we go through the presentations, then we'll be able to see maybe how things could have been done differently or how right things Okay, thank you, Dr. Stella. So let's quick, let's just straight away go to assessment, investigation, and differentials of abdominal pain in children uh, by Dr. Rosinje Jacko. The floor yes. is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for thank you, Dr. Kambale. I don't know if we shall be projecting. Okay, as we as we, we put the presentation up, um, this section for the next 20 minutes, we want to talk about how we can, how we approach this patient in the emergency department. And they present to us with an acute abdominal pain. And this we shall go through how um, we, what we look for in the, in, the, in the history, in the examination, how we go about with the investigations. We also want to focus and remind you of what the goals of the evaluation of this child are. So it's like yes. So in the goals um, of, of uh, examining this patient, you want to you remember that when a child comes to you with uh, an acute abdominal pain, the the conditions can range from a self-limiting um, condition to as simple as a gastroenteritis or a viral illness to a life-threatening condition like the one Dr. Jambo has just presented. Because if that child was not caught on time then uh, the, the post-op would not be as good as we have had, that the child is now doing well. So it's very important for us as we are discussing this to, to understand that um, 
it is important to tell apart between the self-limiting and the threatening conditions. And also, as we discuss further, you're going to realize that some of these presentations are not very, very, very um, reliable. So you may, someone may present you with something very simple, and you may think that, no, this is not an abdominal pain. So the second goal is for us to be able to re-examine these patients, to do a good follow-up. Even if we have sent them from our emergency department to the wards, we must tell the, the continuing doctors to be able to follow up. So they, the, the discussion is going to help us know what are those symptoms and signs that could, could be quite non-specific, but then uh, in just the early stages of these diseases that will progress to give uh, the, the patient um, this life-threatening uh, conditions. So it's important to tell apart the self-limiting and the threatening conditions, but also to know how to follow up those that have presented up with us with the non-specific symptoms. Yes, the differential list of uh, uh, the acute abdominal pain in a child is quite large. This that we are showing you on the screen is just a bit of it, and it can be divided into the different age groups. So, um, and or to do of interest, because, because you see how big this list is, we cannot go one by one, but we are going to look at how we can generally approach this patient with specific interest uh, the topic that uh, we have just been presented to by Dr. Ajambo. And um, yes, so as you can see in the third, in the third column that uh, where exception is, that star you see on the side is just an indication that this is a life threatening condition if you do not uh, intervene in time and manage this patient. So interception happens between that age group, uh, which is, uh, if I remember well, it was our first, uh, our first question. Yes, um, so typically, uh, now talking specifically about this section, the, 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 the child is going to present to us with uh, a triad of vomiting, abdominal pain, and uh, passing bloody, uh, bloody stool, which people call the blood, uh, current jelly stool. So this, um, th th this child is, is, uh, is quite restless. The mother is going to say that what is going to strike the mother may be very many things, that the child's abdomen is distending, or they are worried that this child is vomiting, or this uh, stool that is quite rare that they don't usually pass every day. And uh, in the history, you're going to note that uh, most of these patients are male patients within that age group that we have said. And uh, the, this kind of pain, this is a, a holiki abdominal pain. But obviously, that's, most of that age group will not be able to describe for you clearly what the pain is. So sometimes we rely on the mother to say that the, the mother is saying that the child has an abdominal pain. And how can you rely on the child from a child who is not speaking that they have uh, abdominal pain? So this pain is usually a colicky, intermittent pain, that the child will have episodes of crying and episodes uh, and uh, and uh, episodes of where they are, they are free of this pain and they are quite calm, but so they have uh, repeated attacks of intermittent pain that is colicky and quite severe. The mother may describe for you that when this pain comes, the child draws up the legs and uh, in between these attacks, the child is calm. Um, when they vomit, initially, like the case Dr. Jambo just presented to us, remember that that child initially had a vomiting that was, the vomitus was yellow, but has progressively went on, the, the vomiting what became villus. This is indication that the, the, the disease is progressing to an intestinal obstruction, because it is one of the of the of the causes of intestinal obstruction in this age group. So um, the progression from villa, from non villas to villas is an important indicator for, for the progression of what of this disease. Um, and just to talk about the other causes in history, you have to look about look at the, you remember, look at the different age groups and uh, the other presentations like the area, it may be bloody or non bloody, they may have uh, fevers. We are going to look in the investigations. So, when we are investigating this child in the emergency department, they are going to come to us with a crying child. Uh, the child, we are going to assess them by the primary survey, the ABCD approach, like uh, we have seen uh, uh, Dr. Ajambo uh, break it down for us. In the primary survey, we assess this child's air. Is this clear? We want to make sure there are no secretions, there's no obstruction. And as you saw, this child had a clear airway. They were able to cry, they were able to open and protect their airway. In the breathing, because of this distress, their respiratory rate is going to be um, raised. Yeah? Um, sometimes the, the, the infection may have a sort of a metastatic infection. It may have uh, uh, lung findings or like crepitations 
or uh, chest pain that indicate uh, that they are crop or something like this, but usually they have a clear, uh, clear lung uh, auscultation, maybe percussion, but their respiratory rate will be increased. Like this patient who had a 50, if I remember all the other 58 uh, uh, breaths per minute. And um, then we move down to circulation, which is a very important part uh, of, uh, of, of uh, our assessment. Because remember, this child comes in vomiting, having the urea. So we are losing both electrolytes and fluid. So this fluid that, uh, that is, is being lost, that is not replacing, because remember the child is also refusing to eat. So this uh, child's hemodynamics will start to be deranged. They will start to lose um, uh, intravascular volume because of the vomiting and the diarrhea. So you must do assessment of the volume status of this child. We must do a blood pressure, we must do a cup refill, we must check how warm the limbs are and, and uh, note a uh, temperature gradient of uh, things of this sort to be able to indicate for us what is the hemodynamic status of this patient when they have come to us. And as you saw in the presentation we had, this child was severely dehydrated on our initial uh, examination and uh, contact with the, the child. Um, so um, then, they, which which then directed the, the the management plan for the team that was at the emergency department at the time. You remember this child is also refusing to eat. So as we progressively go down, um, their sugars may go down, um, but this child's uh, normal blood sugars were still normal for seven millimoles per liter. Uh, but also because the changes in the hemodynamic status, the the the, the CNS levels, uh, the the the, the GCS, uh, uh, will slightly be low, or for some it may be normal, but this child is already a distressed child. But in, when you go to exposure, which is a very important part of this assessment, we are going to obviously see that this child is having a uh, distended abdomen. We may or may not see active uh, bowel movements. If we auscultate, we may have increased bowel sounds or absent bowel sounds. When we are palpating, we may have signs of peritonism like guarding. Uh, or you may just say this patient has a rigid abdomen that is not moving with respiration. So these are very important to note, to know, and, and pull out the, the complications of this, uh, of this pathology, how far the, the, the inter uh, interception has gone. Because they could come to us early in the stage or um, at the end of the spectrum when they are having intestinal obstruction, maybe with uh, rupture of gut and uh, uh, subsequent peritonitis. So it's important to do a good uh, abdominal exam, not forgetting the rectal exam that uh, Dr. Ajam also talked about in the child, where on her examining lab there was blood stained mucoid uh, stool, which is important to help put together. Remember from the history where we have been coming, now through the, the, the primary survey, we want to understand. Uh, so putting all these things together pushes you to a particular um, diagnosis. So, and then in the rest of the secondary survey, we examine other systems that could be affected by this current uh, situation or associated uh, conditions or conditions that could have predisposed this child to having this particular cause of the abdominal uh, pain. Um, yes. And also the focused examination for the possible complications that we have talked about, like peritonitis. Um, and um, yeah, now we can go into the investigations. Um, yes, this, uh, sorry, I didn't mention this. This is uh, one of the, uh, this is classically taught in medical schools around up the sausage mass in, uh, in, the, in the right hypochondrial region with, uh, with an empty low right uh, uh, iliac fossa palpation. So this is called a dust sign, but it is, it is not in every patient. So not finding it does not mean that this patient does not have interception. We have to put all the things we have been talking about all the way from the demographics of this patient, the uh, presentation in the history and the examination until now. So when we, uh, when we decide that this patient has interception or they have an acute abdominal pain, we want to, to investigate. These investigations are going to just help BFAF to look maybe for complications, bedside investigations like a random blood sugar, we shall take off samples for a complete blood count. The complete blood count, we shall be interested in the white blood cell count, the neutrophil count, to see if there is any indicators of what an infectious process. Uh, this child was had an anemia, I think that had been on. Though, and so we need also to, to understand what the HB is, because uh, part of the management may involve us taking, uh, calling the pediatric surgical team to take this child in. So we also need to know these things. We, we need to 
the base, the other baseline investigations that we get, we can do are plain radiographs to see complications of like intestinal obstruction, and there are also radiographs that can indicate what signs of uh, inception and other and other um, abdominal acute abdominal causes. Uh, but as the emergency uh, medicine is progressing further, we are having more and more uh, ultrasounds in our emergency department. So we can be able to do an ultrasound examination by the bedside and be able to, uh, if you remember the image that Dr. Ajambo showed us, what we call the bull's eye or the target sign, um, that is what we can be able to see. But remember, we are dealing with the pediatric population. It may be difficult to get this child to, to come down and be able to do this, uh, this examination, but it is, it is the investigation of choice when you want to, 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 to uh, indicate uh, uh, interception by us seeing that target sign. So, yeah, this is the important. But uh, there's also a talk of the contrast enema, which can be used to investigate. It has been a traditional use, um, um, traditionally used investigation for uh, 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 diagnosis of. Uh, of um, um, uh, interception. Yes, what is it for the assessment? So, in the assessment, remember the goals we want to differentiate the self limiting, life threatening, and also to be able to remember the, the non specific signs and I mean, symptoms like lethargy that will in make us be able to follow up these patients, that we catch what we could have missed, so that we don't let the child progress and be able to save this child uh, and identify a life-threatening um, uh, condition. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Osinje, for that uh, wonderful session on assessment, investigation, and differentials of uh, abdominal pain in children. And uh, I think by now we have all understood that uh, it's a diverse Thing, matter and needs to be uh, taken seriously so that we do not miss some of these important life threatening uh, conditions in children. Uh, at this time, I'd like to request uh, Ms. Dagire to take us through the nursing care in a child with this. Yeah. Yes, with the intestinal obstruction. Thank you. Okay, yes, Dr. Nene, once again, this is in the Gile Ali still. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll be taking you through the nursing care for a child with intestinal obstruction. Yes, as nurses, we have a big role to play as far as management for these children is concerned. Our, the nursing care planning goes for a child with intestinal obstruction we go towards providing appropriate information about the child's condition, restoring fruit volume, and preventing dehydration and observing improvement. Because we know these children, as we have seen in the signs and symptoms, they come with vomiting, so vomiting, sometimes diarrhea, they tend to lose a lot of food. So our nursing problem priority is you as a nurse, what should be your priority in handling such a child who has come to you with intestinal obstruction? First will be managed pain and discomfort associated with the obstruction. Uh, we've seen how to assess for the pain, how we will be in position to tell if a baby or a child is in pain. Uh, you monitor for signs of bile obstruction or ischemia. Doctors has already discussed a number of them. Administer appropriate food and provide hydration support. This is very important because we've seen vomiting diarrhea. The children tend to lose a lot. Uh, we are risking electrolyte imbalances, so we have to ensure that we administer foods as required. Then, if we 
If the child requires surgery, we plan for the surgical intervention. Uh, okay, nursing intervention and actions, because, okay, I didn't want to focus so much on specifically the interception, reason being intestinal obstruction regardless of the cause remains an emergence. So whether it is in, due to interception or any other cause, as long as it is intestinal obstruction, it is a surgical pediatric emergency. You receive the child on the ward, Yes, as nurses, we also have our part of doing a, a, a nursing assessment, and this one should be a quick one. Reason being, we are dealing with a life, a life threatening condition, and if we delay, we, we are risking the child's life. So, in your assessment, you obtain subjective data. I gave an example of the name, age, and sex of the baby. Uh, and objective data, you have to pay attention to the signs of obstruction. I gave uh, a few of them, that is pain, uh, that is abdominal pain, vomiting, extended abdomen, look out for signs of dehydration and much more signs and symptoms. Uh, our interventions are continuing. You obtain an intravenous line or access. You can do all blood for investigation. Sometimes these children will come to you when they have already their results or if they don't have. So as you're putting the line, because we know how hectic it is to get blood in children, you can draw the blood for investigation. That is if they do not have them. Uh, the type of investigations you have already seen, doctors already discussed them. Uh, then you monitor vital observations most the pulse, temperature, and SPO2. I focus on this one because in our settings, any the government setting where I am, we do not have those BP cuffs for children. So at least the pulse and the temperature plus SPO2 will tell you whether things are okay or are not okay. You take the weight, it is very important because I mean we give treatment depending on the body weight and you not any deviations. First, an endogastric tube to decompress the descended abdomen, as this will also improve on the breathing. In doing this, you have to note the color and amount of what is coming through that NG tube. I administer oxygen if the child is in distress, and the level of distress will guide you on how much to give. You may find someone is saturating between or okay, above 85, you will not give them the same amount of oxygen as someone who is below 80. So you pay attention to that. Administer analgesics, preferably or acetamol, either intravenous or rectal in the case child has no diarrhea. Usually, if you're in a setting where you have doctors, they prescribe. But if you're at the center and you have received a child uh, who is having IO and you need to relieve the pain, remember that is our priority. Uh, you give at 15 milligrams per kilogram body weight or as ordered by the doctor. You administer IV fruits as ordered or you can give a bolus of ringers lactate at 20 mils per kg start. However, this can be repeated depending on the demand. Doctor will throw more light on that in the next presentation. Uh, first, I will need catheter with her in that and not the amount and the color of the urine. Now, this is very important because remember we said you have to pay attention to we have to look for signs of dehydration. If someone is not passing urine, or if they don't have urine at all, that will give you a sign that you probably things are not okay and you really need to hydrate the child. Administer prophylactic antibiotics. Usually go for cefriaxone, that is at 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram by the weight, and the IV metronidazole at 15 milligrams per kg as a loading dose or as ordered. 
I'm putting the meal grants per kg because in uh, some centers, you may not be having a doctor ready available at that moment, and you need to do the needy full as you wait for them. So blood transfusion may be done depending on the CBC results. Usually these children come when they are really, really sick. So if you have done a CBC or if you have, you have assessed and you think the child may need blood, then it can be given. Obtain a fluid balance chart to monitor the output and the input. This is very important because it will show us the progress. If we remember we are interested in giving IV fluid, so if we are not monitoring, we shall not know if we are on the right track or we are missing out on something. Uh, we are dealing with IO, so we restrict feeding by mouth. <laughs> And explain to the parents or attendants the reason as to why you're stopping their child from feeding. I've seen this one happening so many times. A, a mother will ask you, Musa, why are you refusing my child from feeding? So you give them information as to why so that they don't be anxious and they be when informed. Maintain the child on the maintenance foods as their NPO to prevent hypoglycemia and the other complications. Yes, we are not feeding, we are vomiting, we are having diarrhea. So it is important to maintain them on maintenance foods. That is dextrose, either saline or, or dextrose lingers, 10%. Provide information to the parents concerning surgical interventions and allow for questions about the procedure to help allay their anxiety. As parents, of course, you know when your child is sick and they are telling you they are taking them to theater, they have not told you anything, you will be worried. But as, as you provide information to them, they will be relieved of that anxieties and they will know that yes, what is going to be done is actually helping my child. So after all you've done the quick resuscitation, remember we are in emergency management, you have to obtain an informed consent from the parents. And if the child is stable, remember doctor said when they reached the theater, the resuscitation plan had to change from what they had done before. Reason being, the child was not fit for surgery uh, because they didn't have enough healing. So they had to resuscitate. Now in this case, if uh, the child is stable, they have healing, uh, HB is okay, they can stand an aphasia, you take the child to theater. Yes. In our post operative management, it will depend on the type of operation that has been done. Reason being, sometimes they just do a reduction or they perform a, a, a stomach placement. They do exploratory part of it. Uh, with a stomach or they just reduce. So depending on what they have done, you receive the child from theater. Uh, you follow the post operation instructions. Usually these ones come when they're well written. So you follow those instructions and see what the doctors have said. Usually you continue administering an algesia as ordered, administer IV fruits as ordered. Usually, it is on a two hour basis because our child is still NPO. You might have for bleeding from the incision side. This is very important because we don't want our child to go into the anemia or get any other complications due to bleeding. Next. Also, monitor vital signs as ordered until stable. Usually, we do quarterly, then we do half hourly, depending until when the child is stable. Now, at this point, you may need, it will depend. The doctor may say, keep on oxygen or not. So, we pay attention to the instructions. We emphasize the need for NP or remember, so you took the child to see it and the mother will think that everything is okay, but again, you're still denying them feed. 
you explain the need for their child to remain NPO for some time. Maintain the urine catheter as ordered. Remember, we, we passed it. And still monitor any put and output and, out, and document on a food balance chart. Encourage two hour and get tube aspiration, noting the amount and the color. Now, this one I use the encourage because you may find you in a very busy setting where you will not be in position to do the two hourly energy aspiration. You teach the mother, you get them involved in the treatment of their child. So you encourage, or you, if you're able to do it two hourly, you can do, but if you're not because of the department being busy, you teach them. You involve them in the management and you note down the color and the amount plus the time of aspirating. You continue reassuring the parents to lessen their anxiety. Now remember I said the management will depend on the type of operation that is done. In addition to the postoperative management we have seen, in the case of a stoma, they are put a they are put a stoma on a child. In addition to what we have seen, you teach the parents. Okay, provide the information about the stoma. You tell them what it is, why they are put it, and you teach them how to carry out stoma care. Thank you so much for listening to me. Love and serve. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for that wonderful presentation. There, I noted a question in the, the Q&A, yes. specifically for you. When the time comes, I'll read it for you. Um, I think let's go straight away to the management of intestinal obstruction um, interception. Dr. Nimanya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Maybe we can wait for the PowerPoints to come up. As the PowerPoint comes up, Alice has done actually most of the work on uh, management. Usually management is a team effort. Um, you find, you might find where you're working, you're so short staffed and you find some of the nursing work will actually fall to you, whether you're a medical officer or whether you're just a surgeon. So it usually cuts across, it's good to have a team that you can actually work with and depend on. Okay, so um, it's management of pediatric IO, uh, specifically we'll discuss in this section because that was our case, but I'll try and squeeze in a little bit more where I can. Uh, since our general outlook was uh, acute, was acute abdomen in children. Okay, so uh, my first slide basically looks at some general principles that are, like I just want you to keep this at the back of your mind every time you encounter a child with an I.O. So what you're trying to think of is um, the slide uh, Dr. Jacob had, uh, post, had uh, shared where he showed uh, the different differentials as per age group. Anytime you encounter a child, you're thinking, is this a congenital or is this acquired? That will kind of decide which type of uh, management you need to go in for. Some of the congenital you might have to deal with immediately, while some can actually wait for you to uh, stabilize a child. Um, well, for the acquired ones, like the intersusception one, um, that also takes a different path. But also, why this is important is because it's also going to guide the investigations that you want, that you want to ask for. So let me give an example. So congenital I.O., like uh, things that uh, may be anorectal malformation, um, things like uh, neonatal hernias, as opposed to acquired, where you have pyloric stenosis, you have the intersusception ones. Uh, things like harsh sprung might cut across. It's congenital, but it can present later in life. It won't present in the first few days. So if you have a two-day-old, which brings me to the next principle, age, your age is also going to determine your list of differentials. So if it's a two-day-old that has come in, are you thinking this is a child that has a perception? Maybe they have bloody stools in their diaper. And for you, what you remember is, ah, red currant jelly stools into perception. But it's a two-day-old, and we've talked about the age group. So then you start and think, so two-day-old, most likely congenital. 
anything that can give me bloody stools in a two day old that's congenital. And that's when it hits you. Malrotation with mid gut volvulus. So, edge is really important because it's also going to help you sort out your differentials. And again, that will help you because the invest investigations you ask for. So, imagine this is a two day old, it's malrotation with mid gut volvulus, but you ask for an ultrasound scan because you thought it was interception. You're more likely going to miss it. That would then be the investigation of choice for this one. Then, the next other principle is the sex. And especially this one is for the age group that is has hit puberty, is adolescent. You have a child coming in with right iliac fossa pain. All of us know right iliac fossa pain. The first differential that comes to our mind, appendicitis. That's the first thing you're running for. But it's a girl. We've seen so many ovarian cysts that have twisted, gotten torsion because someone thought it was appendicitis. They wanted to give it time. Or they thought it was an appendicular mass or an appendicular abscess. And they made just the wrong incision for going in. So those are also some of the things that you keep at the back of your mind because sex will determine some of your differentials. Um, then something else to think about. Could this be inflammatory? Is it obstructive or is it a mass effect? And why I say this is, um, let me give an example. A child comes in with that colicky pain that you're thinking about, maybe let's say a three-year-old, then the category of intersusception. But then, are there differentials that you could think about? Can acute pancreatitis present in this way? Is acute pancreatitis something you'd want to take to theatre? As you're thinking of your differentials, do you maybe want to run uh, serum lipase or serum amylase among those things? So again, just keep at the back of your mind. Or obstructive, uh, like here you're thinking mechanical obstruction vis-a-vis -vis, uh, maybe what you will have as a non-mechanical. So is it harsh sprung where I have an aganglionic segment or is this intersusception where something is blocking? For mass effect, this will come in importantly if you have tumors. Children do get tumors, they are very common. You'll find renal tumors, you'll find pelvic tumors, rhabdomyosarcoma. So just think of this, you don't want to open up a child and find, ha, ah, it was tumor, because we know oncology in children or tumors in children are multidisciplinary. You don't just handle it as yourself. So you need to bring your oncologist on board, you need to bring your radio oncologist, you need to bring your pathologist. So just keeping this at the back of your mind. This was my general principles as you get a child and you're working through your differentials and trying to think of what could this be. Okay, that aside, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so here, preoperatively, so you have a child that has come in with IO. Um, they basically talked about everything. The first question is, is your patient stable or do they need resuscitation? Resuscitation is an ongoing process. Um, in the case that Dr. Jumbo presented, they said their child was dehydrated, severely dehydrated, and they instituted plan C. And well and good, uh, 30 mils per kilogram per body weight for the first hour, and then the rest 70 mils within the five hours. But like we said, resuscitation is an ongoing process. It means you need to actually keep looking at your resuscitation. In the chat, someone had said, huh, a six months old passing a urethral catheter. Yes, size six French, size eight French. We even pass feeding tubes in our babies as young as one day old, two day olds. You'll find urine output is actually one of your best markers for noting resuscitation as opposed to your heart rate, which might be influenced by other things, pain or fear, those might make your heart rate go out. Urine output for dehydration will literally give you the way you're going, so pass that tube. If you're in a setting where you're able to wear the diapers, some of you have those, well and good, you can wear the diapers. As we work in Resource Limited, our parents can hardly afford diapers, but just making sure you're doing that as needed. So you give your bolus a 20 mils per kg. Doesn't mean then you go away and come back for hours. No, 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 no. After one hour, look at how much urine the child has made. Is it adequate or do I need to repeat another bolus? If they need another bolus, you give it. Again, within one hour, you're coming back to see it's a continuous process. And this also goes as well as to labs resuscitation. If you do labs and you have a hypokalemia, a hyponatremia, and you have resuscitated, you might actually want to repeat these labs again. What do my labs say? Are they much better? Or do I need to change my fluid management? Maybe you started with your plain normal cell line, but you have a persistent hypokalemia. Do you need to bring KCL on board? And you know, before you bring potassium chloride, again, you need to look at your child's urine output. Are they making good urine? You don't want to give a child potassium chloride that's not making good urine. You need to just shut down their kidneys. So for resuscitation, it is ongoing. Is your child resuscitated enough to go and make a line at the X-ray department or the ultrasound department? You don't want to say, oh, diagnosis, severe dehydration, let's start fluids, but then I also need an ultrasound scan. So your child is getting to ultrasound before you've actually resuscitated them. So the key thing is resuscitation, like Dr. Jacob had said. And secondly, 
what you're going to ask yourself, which imaging modality is better suited for the patient. So this one I brought it in broadly, um, not really for interception because we've discussed about that. Ultrasound is the most specific for interception, you're looking for your target sign or your donut sign or your bull eye sign. But generally speaking in IO, I know most of us when we think IO, we are thinking, ah, erect abdominal radiograph, we are looking for air fluid levels. Unless that child comes with pyloric stenosis, would an X-ray be the best imaging modality for this child? So there are some conditions which a child will come with an ultrasound is actually much better than what? Than radiography. So you find intussusception, pyloric stenosis, ultrasound will be the first thing, especially if you work in a resource limited setting where the patient has to pay for the imaging. So you don't want to ask for an X-ray and by the time you realize I asked for the wrong one, then the patient tells you I have no more money to ask for another imaging modality. So just think about it, which one is the best for my patient and then go ahead with that one. Then the other question to ask yourself, what does the hematological picture look like? This one I already talked about it. So you've done your CBC, you've done your electrolytes. There might be some conditions, especially in a child who has come with a long history. Maybe they've had a long history of vomiting for a long time. You might not just want to do that baseline electrolytes. You might want to do extended electrolytes for this child or someone who you see looks malnourished. What's their albumin like? What's their total protein like? What's their calcium magnesium like? Some of these things are actually going to affect you, especially if you're going to theater once they give the drugs. So you just want to think, what does the blood picture look like? Are there things I need to do before I actually go to theater? And then repeat your tests and then look at them. Do they look much better? Is my child able to go to theater now? Or if they're not going to theater, then well and good. You're just able to risk them, it still goes within the resuscitation picture. Okay, so on my next slide, um, I think I have two other questions. Yes, does my patient actually need surgery? So they say the best surgeon is one who knows when not to cut. So like we had talked about, your resuscitation, especially now like that we're discussing intussusception, there's some intussusception that will resolve on its own. You will resuscitate your patient and then before you know it, ah, they are passing like green looking stools, the abdominal distension seems to go down. You palpate the abdomen again that was previously distended. Now it's not. If you are previously feeling a mass, you don't feel a mass. Doesn't mean you had committed, you had consented, gotten your blood ready, anesthesia is there saying, are you bringing the patient? Don't be in a hurry. Just get an ultrasound scan again. Let's look. Does my patient actually need surgery or has it resolved? There's different types of actually. Let me use this opportunity. Some other children will come to you with abdominal pain, but without vomiting. You will do an ultrasound scan and it says into susception, but the abdomen is not distended. I think many of us have seen those. That's what they call transient intussusception. They say at some point people will have into susception that doesn't necessarily cause obstruction. It can resolve on its own. So not all into susception that you find is actually going to need surgery. You correlate it with a clinical exam. If you've done your resuscitation and the child seems a little bit better, repeat your ultrasound scan and see what it says. Maybe it has resolved and maybe your child doesn't need surgery. Then another question, are there any procedures that are useful as my patient awaits to go to theater? This one, I'll bring it in the broad category of IO in children. So we know um, some, especially for the congenital ones, we know there are some congenital obstructions that will present but with an association to other congenital anomalies. Let me give an example of anorectal malformation. So a child comes in, you've examined, no anus, abdomen is grossly distended, there's no fistula, and you know, I need to go and put a stoma. But then at the back of your mind, first think about it, it's anorectal malformation. We know there's an association with the bacterial triad. Have I ruled out an esophageal treasure? Like, are there any other anomalies? Could there be a cardiac anomaly here? Do I need an echo before? We've seen esophageal treasures diagnosed on table. The child was taken, anorectal malformation to put a stoma. And then because they were saying, ah, let's pass an NGT on table, all of a sudden NGT doesn't seem to be going anywhere. They are bugging and then, Baby starts seem to go down, and before you know it, there's a diagnosis of esophageal treasure made on table. So especially for those IOs that will come congenital, just think, are there any documented associated anomalies that I might want to? You might need to do an echo before you go to theater, unless your child gets a cardiac arrest as you're waiting. Or for those like I've talked about, the neurotoma commission, just pass an NGT and see, is there any resistance? Can it go? Just rule out these things. And basically, it's all to maximize the outcome of your child as you go to theater. You don't want to get a daughter table. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Those were things to consider. Um, ah, yeah, I posed the question, the last question. Yes, 
are there any procedures I can do as my child awaits to go to theater? Especially for those of you who are working in settings where maybe you have no surgeon and you're going to have to refer that child. Is there something I can do maybe to help? So this is an example of, uh, this, is, this is just a different eye. Oh, it's not interception, but this is an neonate. And I think you'll be able to see, I don't have a cursor, but there's a bunch of air under the right hemidiaphragm, both under the right and the left hemidiaphragm. So you can see that that free air so this is a child that has a pneumoperitoneum. We know pneumoperitoneum in a child, babies are abdominal breathers. Their chest wall muscles are not yet that well developed. So meaning if there's something that's causing pressure in their abdomen, they're not really going to breathe well. And at some point in time, they're going to give up. But then now this is a child, you have no surgeon, you're supposed to refer. The abdomen is distended. What can you do in your setting? Pneumoperitoneum. I know everyone knows for a pneumothorax, that one is very easy, you decompress. So no more peritoneum, is there something that you can do where you are before maybe you refer to the surgeon? Or maybe you're able to do the surgery, but let's say there's a delay in processing theater, maybe labs are not yet okay, or we had the hypokalemia that needs resuscitation, or we are not yet making enough urine, we still need to go on with our resuscitation before we go to theater. But then my abdomen needs decompression before my child stops breathing. So yes, there's something that you can actually do. On the next slide. And it's a very easy, it's what we call a peritoneal drain. Very easy to place, you don't even need theater. All you need is local anesthesia. So usually the point that we usually love to choose is the right iliac fossa, what you call like your McBurney's point. Infiltrate, most of the children actually who have a normal peritoneum will have a distended abdomen. It won't really be flat. So the layers of the abdomen have just been stretched out. So just infiltrate local anesthesia, 1% lignocan. Per kilogram body weight, you have calculated everything in pieces per kilogram body weight. Make a small incision with a blade after you've infiltrated through your skin, and then bluntly just go through the muscles until you hit peritoneum. Once you hit peritoneum and you poke it with your artery forceps, you'll be able to hear a gush of air, or if there's stool or any content, it will gush out. With a finger of a glove, a surgical glove, just cut one finger, cut it on both ends, it's like an open tube. Fix that in, and then suture it to one part of your incision. That's a peritoneal drain. It's going to let the air come out. It's going to let the enteric contents come out. It's basically going to decompress your abdomen. This will actually buy you time. So at least now you know my respiration is not going to be compromised. I will be able to resuscitate my patient nicely with time. I'm not on pressure to actually go to theatre. And it's something that we can all do where we are. Okay, the next slide. Another intervention that you can do as you wait for surgery, another procedure that you can do. So what if it's not air? We all have these children who come, abdomen is distended, but it's not air, and it's we, what the, the Fs that we know, fetus, fletus, fluid, all those, fat, yeah. So these are two children, there's a neonate here, and then there's an older kid here, and the abdomens are grossly distended. At this time, they have fluid. Now children can present to you this, because we are talking about acute abdomen in children. So what if you get these ones? I know most of us in adults, the first thing that comes to our mind is, I need to tap the fluid. That is all, the way to put in your drain and tap the fluid. Now in children, when you tap these abdomens, you really need to be mindful. First of all, um, any fluid that you remove is going to cause fluid shifts. So you're going to remove this fluid, but fluid is going to shift. And remember the fact that this abdomen is this distended, there's pressure on your IVC, it's basically being compressed. If you completely get this fluid out, your IVC is basically going to open out, your fluid has shifted in it. Before you know it, your patient has no blood pressure. They have collapsed completely, completely. So here, what we usually do is we do what we call serial tapping. And as we serial tap, so yes, you have this distension, it's causing respiratory distress, you need to do something. We're not saying you don't have to remove that fluid, but you need to just decompress it a little bit for your child to actually be comfortable. As you work up your investigations, you get ready to deal with the primary pathology. So serial tapping, the way you normally tap, but here your goal is not to remove all the fluid. You just want to remove as little as possible to relieve symptoms. But whatever you remove, you literally have to replace intravenously. Actually, this has just reminded me of something. Um, when Alice talked about NGTs that are placed in intersusception and are aspirated on every two hours, why we do every two hours is because for every amount that we aspirate, we replace an equal volume in addition to our maintenance fluids. So you don't want your child, those are losses, the NGT are losses. So you don't want to get your NGT, you tie it to a glove, and then at the end of 24 hours, you're counting the amount. 
Because imagine if it's like a five kilogram baby and out of the NGT came maybe 1.5 liters. So at 24 hours, I need to push 1.5 liters into this child. So you want to replace the losses as they actually happen. And two hours is usually good enough. As you're giving your maintenance fluids, you look at your fluid chart. The last two hours, this is how much we lost. And then you add that onto the maintenance. So yes, so here, even for what you tap, you want to replace that within the intravascular space so that you do not uh, basically crush the child's babies. Next slide, the other intervention that you can possibly do before you go to theatre. Um, next slide. Sorry, I had a lot of pictures. I don't remember what's on the next slide. <laughs> but I know it's another intervention. Yes, um, we had talked about differentials. I brought this one in particular because it is very missed. It's one of the most missed causes of acute abdomen. You know, when a child comes in with vomiting, abdominal distension, all we focused about is the abdomen. Rarely do we remove those pampas to look at what's happening in the groin. So you have children who have been referred to you if they are talking about IO needs emergency laparotomy but no one actually examined the groin. And especially in baby boys, you might find there's an incarcerated in guaino honey, and that's where your problem is. So why I brought this up is, this is also something that you can actually do where you are, reduce the honey, and adjust slight sedation, conscious sedation. In the units, you might not even need sedation, just rectal paracetamol, we are able to do this. So try as much as possible as you can to push the honey back, just to push it back. It can also buy you time. As like I said, all these are things that we are trying to do as we wait to get the baby to theater. So whether you're referring the child or not, sorry, in any child that comes to you, just make sure you're doing a full examination. Like Jacob said, exposure. Just make sure you're seeing everyone from head to toe. It's very sad for someone to miss something that could have just been fixed. So yes, reducing the honey. There's techniques, you just need two hands. Um, under some sedation or under analgesia, it's very possible as you wait for theater. So this was AOP on the general I.O. So now moving on to intersection. the next slide. Yes, uh, we talked about how intersection can present. Uh, there's one particular way I want to bring to your attention, because this is some of the ways you might see a child coming to you. They had the colic, abdominal pain, uh, maybe they had the bilas vomiting. They didn't really have any red currant jelly stools, but the mom saw a mass protrude from the rectum or from the anus. And then this is what you see. And why I brought this out is because we've seen people push this back and manage as rectal prolapse, or they think it's just rectal prolapse and move it here. So it's basically, how can you differentiate a rectal prolapse from an intersusception? And I know most of you know this, but I'll just reiterate it for those that do not know it. So because for a rectal prolapse, it's your rectum that's prolapsing, if you're able to use a spatula or a tongue depressor, pediatricians usually have those ones. And you pass it between the prolapsed mass and the child's um, anodum, where the skin is. For a rectal prolapse, your spatula is not going to go far because the rectum has prolapsed. So there's no space, the rectum is out. So you'll just basically be heating and getting resistance. But if it is into susception, remember your rectum is still in. There's just a mass coming through your, your rectum. So as you put your spatula, it will keep going. It actually doesn't hit any resistance. It's going through your rectum, it will go nicely. So that's when you'll know this is intersusception. It's not rectal prolapse. So with a rectal prolapse, yes, there's ways to manage those, those that you know, but intersusception, that's what we're talking about now. This is not a child that you just need to push this back or pour sugar on it, let it go down, take the buttocks, the things that you do for rectal prolapse and send home. This is a child that you actually going to need to what? To send to theatre and also resuscitate. Okay, um, the next slide. So how we manage intussusception? Um, you've all heard about the non-operative reduction of intussusception, which can either be pneumatic with air or hydrostatic, uh, basically. And this, uh, I guess, is, well, it's been uh, done in uh, high resource centers uh, under fluoroscopy. But then with a low middle income or, can I say, the low income countries, we always find a way of improvising and making things work. Now, why actually we're having this talk is because the nanoparty reduction is key for children that will present early. 
if you have a child that's coming late, a child that is peritonitic, a child that is hemodynamically uh, compromised, that's not a child that's going to be suitable for nanoparticle reduction. Nanoparticle will be for a child that has really come early, their symptoms were picked up early, they were not treated for dysentery for two weeks, there's no suspicion of necrotic bowel, no. You still resuscitate them the way you would, and you can see this uh, infant here has a police catheter that's draining urine. So you resuscitate them the way that you normally would, and then you take them to, um, well, in ideal places, it would be in a radiology suit because you're doing it under fluoroscopy. Now, here we know we don't really have fluoroscopy. Uh, even where I work, we don't have fluoroscopy. But we know ultrasound scan is good at seeing that target sign. So ultrasound is something that you can use. Uh, Dr. Jacob was saying we are seemingly getting more point-of-care ultrasounds. Everyone seems to have an ultrasound in their pocket, so which is really good. So basically, what you can do is you improvise. There's a Foley catheter that you have seen there and uh, the, someone dismantled the normal BP, BP cuff that you have. You have your pump that you usually pump your air in, but then you also have your sphygmometer. And why this one is important is because you don't just pump any amount of air that you want to, there are pressures. So there's usually a range between 80 to 120 millimeters of mercury, and 80 is for the younger ones. If you say you have a three months old, a four months old, a five months old, that's a child you want to start and see is 80 millimeters sufficient, as opposed to maybe a three year old or a three and a half year old, that one would like to go to the higher pressures. So you put your Foley catheter in, get a very good seal within the rectum, get a very good seal so you can balloon it actually, uh, connect, you have your pump, you have your sphygmomanometer, and you're basically just pumping. So the assumption is someone here has an ultrasound or there's someone with an ultrasound that is very nearby because once we pump our air, then we're going to want to do an ultrasound and then see uh, where is our mass. So some people might actually pump the air while following that target sign and see as it actually moves through the bowel to see whether it's reducing the mass within the bowel. If you don't have that, and maybe you have one sonographer in the hospital, he's the one doing everyone's scans. So maybe you'll come pump your air, then take your baby to radiology. They do the ultrasound, say, ah, uh, yeah, it has moved before it was here. So you're allowed as, multi as many attempts as possible showing that it's moving. If there's no signs that it seems to be moving, so our target is basically to see with ultrasound, your target is to basically follow your mass until it's reduced. If you have fluoroscopy and you're using air, you want to see to the small bowel. Uh, so this would be the ideal for those that are candidates. Uh, bear in mind that uh, you might perforate bowel as you do this, so theatre still needs to be ready. Even as you go in for this intervention, you've informed theatre. We have this baby that we're going to do this, there's a chance it might fail. Even when you're counselling the parents and getting consent, it might fail or um, there might be a complication for this. And if you do perforate and you're using air, you can just use a needle to decompress. Just stick a needle in the most deep, if you're waiting to basically go for the part of it. Decompress, get air out of the child as soon as possible. So this is the nanoparty reduction. This is, I was demonstrating air, but you can use, uh, there's the hydrostatic paper using normal saline these days, and still that can be followed under fluoroscopy or uh, ultrasound. So what do we do as who do not have these things? That's on the next slide. Uh, it basically means we're going to have to take this child for exploratory laparotomy and open them up. And when you open them up, uh, this first slide, that's what you're more likely to see. I think you're able to see that mass. Um, there's a bit of dusky looking bowel that then enters pink bowel. So that's where the intersection has actually happened. The dusky looking bowel is the bowel now that's proximal that entered. So basically it's blood supply and blood return has been compromised that's why it's looking dusky it's all within this pink looking one this pink looking one is the colon for it all it did was receive the bowel that came in so it's blood supply is not really compromised at most it's actually eating matters uh, for those of you that are surgeons on the call i know um, doing this is we talk about milking but before you milk we usually say just the bowel is very edematous if you're very quick and hesitant to go and start milking chances are you're actually going to get tears within the bowel so we usually say get some warm soaked gauze pieces and squeeze this intussusceptum as much as possible just to get the edema down so that you're able to milk it nicely without getting any perforations and when you milk it this is what it looks on the other side the proximal bowel still looks dilated and dusky don't be in a hurry to reset this bowel. Get again your warm saline, cover it, give it time to recover. It's been obstructed for a while. Um, if it keeps changing, you'll see it turn from dusky, getting a little bit pinker and pinker and pinker, and you keep it. So this is a good reduction. There were no perforations, nothing. Probably, probably like Dr. Jambo's baby. Now, it might not always look like this, and that's the next slide. 
at times your bowel you might actually go in and the bowel that you reduce or the bowel that you find is dead bowel so it might not all be dead but some of it might be dead so then what options do you have this picture is not for an interception baby don't be scared i just needed a picture of dead bowel show you what dead bowel looks like but since we are talking about io and i have this picture i'll make a comment if you open up a child, we're talking about malrotation and midgut volvulus. If you opened up a child and you found this picture, all the midgut is dead. What do you do? Are you going to resect from duodenum down to sicker? Take all the small bowel out. What do you do? So those also decisions because we get these babies. You need to think about it. If I take out this child's midgut, what are their chances of survival? So where I work, we'll do different things. We'll take pictures. We might bring the parent in and tell them this is the child's bowel. All of it is dead. There's nothing much that we can do. Or if it, you've corrected the malrotation and you think it can survive, there's what they call the just damage control surgery. You look at it, put it back the way it should be. Give it 48 hours. Resuscitate the child and then come back. At times you're surprised. It's picked up or most of it has picked up. And some of it has been said. So again, don't be in a hurry to reset. You can give the bowel time to declare itself. You don't have to come out with it because it's dead. But now in the aspect of intersusception, so we have some dead bowel. What are the, some of the options we have? So I know most of the literature is going to talk about resect and anastomose the bowel. Um, others will say you can bring out stomas. In our setting, what we have noticed is with resect and anastomose, um, there was a high occurrence of leaks, and not because the surgeons had a bad technique. These are surgeons that do perfect anastomosis, so their technique is not at fault here. But we just realized even when you went back, you found that where you had anastomosis, the bowel had actually gotten necrotic. The inflammatory process had actually continued. So that's when we realized, huh? And that's why we talked about resuscitation in intersusception even continues postoperatively, especially once you've milked this bowel, you've released the obstruction. There's these oxygen-free radicals that are going on. So these children are at high risk of reperfusion injury. So your resuscitation and monitoring still needs to go on. And especially it's those that have good bowel that just get hit by the reperfusion injury. So yeah, so dead bowel, please. If you really, if you really, really take anything home from this point, just bring out stomas. Stomas in children are temporary. They don't grow with them. They don't die with them. We bring them temporarily. They get out of the state they're going in, and then we put them back in. So just bring out stomas uh, in this child. Get what's obviously dead out. Put stomas. Over time, you'll keep monitoring your stomas. Some of them might keep breaking down, getting a little bit necrotic. That's okay. You can refashion them and come back for this child. Within six weeks, you can reverse your stomach and your child is okay as opposed to getting a leak. So the next slide, I think my next slides are just pictures of, uh, yes. So this was a child with intersusception. Now we can see the abdomen is distended and there's an incision that is under the umbilicus, kind of like a fanestio, but it went up, there's stool through the incision, but then there's a stomach in the other corner Then there's some stool around the stomach. It's just disastrous, and this is a postoperative child. So first of all, what's our approach when we go in? I know some books that you read that haven't been updated will say because the mass intersusception is more common, iliocolic intersusception is the most common. So they assume that's where it's going to be. So you can make an incision in the right lower quadrant and go in. But remember, this is an exploratory laparotomy. Do not be tempted to go to the right lower quadrant and make your incision there. Make the incision that will give you the best exposure. That's principle number one of surgery when you're choosing your incision site. I want the best exposure when I'm going in. And we're just going to look at choice of incision. But I just want to show you what a wrong incision is. This is a wrong incision. I know it did not start out all the way. It's probably said in the right lower quadrant. You thought they'd find their mass there, reduce it, close and come out. But now you find your interception went all the way to the sigmoid. Now trying to approach the sigmoid from your right lower quadrant, or like their child that we talked about, where it had prolapsed through the rectum in that small incision. Then they ended up extending it because you can't reach the sigmoid from here. But now look at the incision the child has. So also something else, when we reduce this bowel, we are happy. All oh, bowel has been reduced, it's viable. Just inspect your bowel. At times, there might be perforations. We talked about how bowel is edematous. There might be a perforation that you really not notice. So just inspect your bowel nicely as you palpate to see, are there any pathological lead points? Do I have a perforation? Milk content through and really look. You can actually miss a perforation. So I think these people went in, bowel looked dead. They resected what was dead. They brought out stomas. But then you can definitely see there's stool leaking. So most likely there was a perforation that was missed somewhere. Or maybe they caused inadvertent damage that they didn't notice. And then this is where the child ended up. So this is what not to do. Okay, on the next slide. Um, 
sorry, I don't really remember what's on my slides, it's pictures. Yes, we were talking about incisions. So the first incision that be like us is that side, the incision is this side. So it's like as if it's a paramedian incision. The child has a stoma. This is not an intersusception child, by the way, but I just wanted to use this opportunity because it's acute abdomen and we might go in for laparotomies. And then the child, this other ends, um, the umbilicus is there. So I don't know if they wanted to do a sumi, but then they went off midline. So it's kind of curving in its own way. Again, these are incisions that in children, these are not incisions you'd want to go for. We talked about the incision that gives it a maximum exposure. So we can move to the next slide. So these are possible incisions, but I'm going to just focus on two incisions. Now in children, especially the younger ones, less than, uh, I would say about five years. If you've seen a three months old child and a, maybe a six year old child, the infants tend to have round bellies. Their bellies are rounder. They are wider in a, that's the horizontal axis, in the horizontal axis as opposed to the vertical axis. So you'll find for adults, most of the incisions that we make are midline incisions. We might make a sub -like midline incision or a full midline incision. But if you have a three months old child, their abdomen is shorter in that axis, in the vertical axis. If you give them a midline incision, you're not going to get the maximum exposure. That's the least, the least um, exposure you'd get. So you'll find for most of our children under about five, under six, you can examine your child and see which is my widest diameter in this abdomen. We will have a transverse incision. And yes, that means you're going to have to cut through muscle. The midline is good because you don't cut through any muscle. The transverse, it's a muscle cutting, muscle splitting, you cut through muscle, that's it. And uh, usually we have options for managing pain. I know some of you might say cutting muscle, that's painful, I'd rather go midline. But like I said, the first principle for any surgeon is what incision is going to give me the maximum exposure. So transverse, but your transverse is above the ambilicus. It's not below the ambilicus, it's above the ambilicus. That's where you need to get your maximum exposure. For the older kids, six years, seven years, then you might start going midline. And when you go midline, don't give a full midline. That's not what you think your pathology is. It upper GI. First, give a small incision up, go in, take a look. Then you extend it as need be. It shouldn't be from ziphistanum down to pubis, just one. And then you go in and you find hey, it was just like a small perforation that I would have gotten in a small incision. Just think about postoperatively. The bigger your incision is, the more pain the child is going to have, delayed recovery. So yes, this was just about choice of incisions with the bad ones previously and then um, the others. The other incisions are not really bad right now, so I'll leave those ones alone. And uh, Next slide. So in conclusion, as I basically finish everything that I have said, one is workers' teams. You might be in a place maybe you have no surgeon or you have, it's okay. Technology has come from so far. Just pick up your call and consult. We have people who actually call us when they're stuck in theater. And now WhatsApp has taken it to a whole other level. You can actually video call. And they're able to show you, this is what I'm seeing. Should I just close and come out? And you're like, no, 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 no. Actually, you can do this. You can do this. Like, just call, consult. For us, our team, by the way, we, we are very okay. We are very fine. You can call at any time. Or maybe you have a child and you just want to work through your different shows, or maybe you're going to refer and you want to think, is there something I can do before? Or maybe you just got stuck. You entered something that you thought was something, and then you found something else, and now you're wondering, how, ah, where do I go here? Before you just close up that child and subject them to another surgery, maybe someone can actually offer you help. So just video call them or call them, then let them see what you're seeing. Maybe they can actually talk through you. So yes, consult. None of us knows everything, and it's very okay. Just ask your colleagues. Ask other colleagues, it's fine and working teams. Yeah, I know I've talked about a lot, but uh, basically that's it for management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nimanya Stella, for this wonderful learning session. And um, I would like to re echo the point of calling for help. And it's very, very important, the Ministry of Health, the Department of EMS is emphasizing that we should try as much as possible to call, especially us who want to refer patients. Let's try to call the places where we are referring these patients to ascertain whether they are able to help the patient or not. They tell us their readiness, they give us a go ahead. They may actually give us technical advice on how to be managing the patient we want to refer 
before referral to, in, to, mark, to optimize the patient outcome. So like you're saying, that is very, very important and we need to, uh, our referral mechanisms should include that. Thank you, Dr. Stella. And um, I'm sure there are so many burning questions and uh, discussion points. There are four. Yes, you have yes, I have, a, I, yes, I have a question for Dr. Stella. Uh, um, first of all, you answered most of the questions with your presentation. I think I would encourage all of you that don't have surgeons um, uh, at your health centers to, to call because Dr. Stella and her colleagues can certainly answer a lot of your questions about what you should do if you don't have a surgeon there. Because that was a, a fair number of the questions and you addressed a lot of that. I had one question from the audience um, that maybe you can comment on. How do you evaluate the abdomen of a crying infant when they, right, as opposed to uh, an adolescent or an adult where you could tell them to relax? Mm -hmm. Maybe talk a little bit about the tricks you use to evaluate. Okay, so for a crying child, which is probably 90% of the way <laughs> children are become, they're always going to be crying. Um, it's going to be serial abdominal exam. So yes, a child has come in, they're distressed, it's a strange environment, uh, they have this distension. At least I talked about some of the things. Some of the things we tend to forget are pain management. Dehydration, you're going to run for your fluids, give your antibiotics, but pain is something that you forget. So manage their pain. Um, mom is there, try and keep them manage the anxiety. You might actually do about four or five abdominal exams before you get the signs that you want to. So you've tried now, baby's unsettled, has failed, it's okay, you can come back after a little while, try again and assess and see, are they more cooperative now? Is there something I have gotten? Maybe not, it's, it's a matter of patience. You tailor it to the child, but I would say serial exams, um, just because you failed once doesn't mean give up. You just need to keep coming and keep trying, keep coming and trying. Yeah, that's the best I can get. But keeping the child with the mom does help, managing their pain does help, especially if you have a crying, hungry, irritable child that just wants to feed and nothing will console them. So once you manage them, you can take opportunities. Are they sleeping, sneaking there, try and get an exam done? You might wake them up again. Just yeah, serial. Try and do as many as you can. Yeah, I mean, a trick that I try and used mm -hmm. to do um, sometimes is use the mother to examine the child. Oh. So you have the mother take the mother's hand and have use the mother on your hand on top of the mother's hand mm -hmm. to so, and so they're less threatened uh, by, by your exam. That's a good trick. Thank you. Um, would they really pop them? You have a child that's male per os and you're giving them a lollipop. We would all love to give lollipops, but sadly, there are some instances where your child is nil per os, they are vomiting everything, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for that presentation and educative session. Let's uh, go straight away to the discussions, questions, and answers. Um, Yes, um, we had uh, uh, Dr. Harry, are you going to, you said they have answered yes, most of them. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. There are some which I noted, which I noted here. One was really going to the nursing team representative, Alice. The nurses have something they call a nursing diagnosis. Briefly, someone wa wanted to know about that. You could briefly just highlight what you would have done for this patients in terms of nursing diagnosis. Okay, thank you so much. Respond to that. Uh, the approach I used for this case was not necessarily the nursing diagnosis, the nursing process, but since someone is asking for the diagnosis, I have made for you around three of them. Uh, because we have looked at pain, we have looked at uh, we have looked at pain, we have looked at abdominal distension, I talked of giving oxygen, meaning in the case you have uh, your child is in distress, this is what, these are the diagnoses I've managed to make for you. Uh, I'm looking at abdominal acute pain related to obstruction, secondly, secondly to invagination of the bowel, evidenced by 
uh, we, we have seen that the child will be crying, some of them will be drawing their legs, so you can relate it to anything that you perform on your examination. Um, the second one is ineffective breathing pattern. Still, I'm relating it to the distension, and I'm evidencing it by the difficulty in breathing. I have talked of vomiting, so this is a potential. The pain and the outer D breathing pattern, they are actual nursing diagnoses. They have happened. The child is in pain, and probably they're having difficulties in breathing. But now for, for this one, it is a potential nursing diagnosis, uh, which is the risk for electrolyte imbalance related to vomiting, diarrhea, there we are not evidencing because it has not happened. Another thing I, I talked of you reassuring the parents, so I'm looking at anxiety related to change in health status of the child. I'm evidencing it by the patient, the parents looking anxious or even asking many questions. I mean, when someone is anxious, they'll be asking about this and that. So uh, the interventions we have seen already, those are the nursing diagnoses I have Thank managed. So Hope it is clear. There's a hand raised from uh, Julius. I don't know if you want to, um, Bukaya, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Okay, thank you, Tim, Echo, and Sid for the wonderful presentations. Uh, mine is uh, a question to the pediatric surgeons, uh, to Sid, Echo, as well. Um, and uh, my question goes, one, surgical interventions and good outcomes are a function of timely interventions following early diagnosis uh, by the frontline healthcare workers. Now you realize that the cases start from the health center twos, most likely health center threes or the health center fours, where you find you have no doctor or anybody trained in surgery. Now my question is, as a team of the surgeons, let's say the Pediatric Association of Uganda, or the Association of the Surgeons of Uganda, have you put in place some either standard operating procedures or algorithms or pictorials that can help the frontline healthcare worker look at a picture or have some flow of some information to guide them in suspecting an acute abdomen and be able to come to a conclusion that this case is not mine I should refer it very fast to a surgeon. Thank you, and over to you. Okay. Thank uh, you. Please, go ahead. All right. Thank you for your question. So, um, I actually happen to be a member of the Pediatric Surgery Foundation, Uganda. We have a course that we call the Pediatric Emergency Surgery Course, PESKI. Uh, and basically what we do with this course, uh, we move to different regions. So it started in the north. So when we go to the north, we are basically inviting the health workers from around that region. So let's say people from Lacho, people from Lira, people from Arua, people from Gulu. Last year we were in uh, the eastern region, Mbale. So we invited uh, people from the health center fours, the health center threes, the district hospitals. Early this year we were in Moroto as well. And it's basically the same thing. We target, um, medical officers or general surgeons or clinical officers and what we are doing is basically trying to tell them this is how you can identify this this is what you can do where you're able to this is what you can probably do before you refer the patient if you're going to refer the patient and then uh, we also offer channels of, of uh, referral so basically we leave our phone numbers we are working on a manual so in all these places that we've gone to that we've had the training we usually leave the course materials there so it covers all emergencies into section and erectile malformation, hash sprung, all the pediatric surgical emergencies, trauma, burns, urological emergencies, orthopedic emergencies. We usually go as a team. Anesthesia, because we also deal with the anesthetic providers, whether anesthetic officers, um, those who are basically working in children, and that's what we do to target. So we usually leave course materials. We put those on a flash drive that we leave with the participants. Uh, but we are working on a hard copy manual that um, 
we will also be able to circulate. So please look out for the pediatric emergency surgery course. It usually moves to regions. We've been to the north, we've done uh, the east. Uh, we're thinking of going to the west very soon. Uh, we usually send out an invite. Uh, for those of you, your hospitals usually could reach out to the directors. So the health center calls, those are people we're actually targeting, those that do not have surgeons there, but even for the district hospitals that don't have general surgeons. So we also work with their surgeons and basically just take them through that. So that's the course that's actually happening. And that's what we are doing as the Pediatric Surgery Foundation Uganda. You can check us out also on our website. We do have it. Uh, you'll be able to get some of the material there. Thank you. I think that answers you. Uh, we had a, we had another one. Yeah. Yes. That we have Alex. Alex. Do I unmute? If Alex is not there, we can have Emmanuel. Okay. Alex. I'm here. I'm here. Alex, go ahead. Okay, Alex, first for yes. the presentation. Yes. Thanks, Tim, for the presentation. Welcome. Uh, uh, my concern is about the fevers uh, during during the case presentation. Uh, our child had fevers, but then this is a surgical case, so I was wondering whether these fevers are coming because of intersusception or it might be to the related infections. I don't know where the fevers are coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Oh, let us have Emmanuel and then. Um... Maybe they can be yeah, thank you very much, the team. Um, mine is really simple. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stella and the team. Um, my question is, uh, is there a role of flat test tubes in uh, managing some of these cases and uh, probably what are the indications and um, the outcomes if you've used any? Then um, um, maybe you'll help us avail some of your numbers. So that in case we get these emergencies, we don't uh, take long um, calling. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll add the third question. Someone wanted you to differentiate between dysentery, bleeding due to dysentery, and the, the one for intersusception. So those are three questions. Okay, I, I hope I remember them. I'll just start with the fevers that were asked. So um, we've all heard about the SARS response, the systemic inflammatory, basically your body trying to deal with, and fever is one of the common signs. So in our children that we actually have that are surgical, that have uh, intestinal obstruction, or even children that are postoperative, they do spike fever. So I can understand your concern uh, about wanting to rule out any other pathology. Um, so maybe you're worried, is there another, is there malaria maybe that's coexistent here? That's okay, you can rule that out, but it's, we wouldn't be, we are not shocked that we see a fever in a child coming with intersusception. It's not really shocking. But then also it gives you a kind of a clinical picture of what might be going on. Maybe um, for some of them who have like dead bowel, again, it goes to the inflammatory process that's basically happening they will present with a fever. So ruling out differentials, there's no problem with that. Maybe they have something else going on, but um, it, it's not really a shocker for a, a child to have a fever. We weren't shocked about that. The second question, flatus tubes. tubes, yes. So um, again, when you get a patient with IO, um, what you're thinking about is, how can I decompress this abdomen as best as I can? Uh, because like we talked about, children are abdominal breathers, so you basically want this to come down. So you put in your NGT, and your NGT is decompressing you from up, so your content that's up is getting out through the NGT. So what about downstairs? So for downstairs, we personally have a used flatus tubes. Um, they tend to come out. In kids, it's really difficult and really hard. But what we tend to do is uh, we can do PRs, rectal exams. So we do PRs and we do what we call rectal stimulation. Um, so if you do, imagine this is baby's bum bum, you put in your finger. And I know, oh, by the way, while I'm on this, let me even just say this. If you put a temperature, a thermometer into a baby's bum, you've not done a PR. That is very common for people, especially pediatricians. We use temperatures, <laughs> we use the thermometers and put in the bum, and then you say PR findings. There was some, no, 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 no. Put your finger in, it doesn't matter. Even a one day old, it can take your little pinky. I've seen people with fingers bigger than mine. Put, lubricate it nicely and put it 
in. They said there's no reason to do a PR if you have 10 fingers. Honestly, one of them can do a PR. There's no reason to use a thermometer. So yes, so retro stimulations, we have found those actually decompress. And this, we use them in so many instances. When we have our babies with gastroschisis, when we have hash sprung disease, again, that we want to decompress, we do rectal stimulation. So put in your finger, feel for the sacrum posteriorly, and just stimulate them. You stimulate the, the nerve plexus that's just down there. So just play along with that. Take your finger out. There might be a gush of air, or there might be a gush of stool. So we basically do routine rectal stimulations, and perhaps that's how we decompress. I have not used rectal flatter tubes, but they have been documented. So if you do have them and you find they work for you, just make sure they have not been dislodged. You, you put it in the bum and then think, ah, it's working, but then you come out. But then also, for those kids that have a tight sphincter, you will put in your tube and it will just be closed off by your tight sphincter. So it doesn't really offer you much. So put in your finger, get, it, get all that stuff to basically come out. So stimulate the rectum. The third question was differentiating dysentery from the red current stools. So the pretest had a question, which is the first initial symptom uh, for a child with interception? And I saw there were responses about the red current jelly stools. Why the seed global guys are here bringing this is because we want early diagnosis. Now, red current jelly stools are a late symptom. They are the last thing that's basically going to happen. So in the pathophysiology of intersusception, you have your proximal bowel that has telescoped into the distal. As the bowel goes, it carries its mesentery along with it. Now, because the mesentery has gone in, remember your mesentery is what has your veins and it has your arteries. Your veins are supposed to be bringing blood backwards, your arteries are supposed to be taking. Because veins are more collapsible than arteries, that's going to be the first thing that's going to shut off. So because it shuts off, the blood that has come to bowel cannot go back. Even your lymphatics cannot drain back. Those are easily collapsible. So now that's why we actually have the edema, because the bowel gets congested. It just cannot drain back. And then as that congestion gets more, now your arteries, which are more able to withstand pressure, will also get shut off. So now that's where you actually have the gangrene and the dead bowel coming off. But before the gangrene comes in, once your artery has now shut off, remember, mucosa, where our plexus is, the vessels in the submucosal plexus. The mucosa is the most, can I say, susceptible like to hypoxia. Like if it doesn't get blood, it's going to shed off. The mucosa that sheds off from bowel is what comes as your red current jelly stools. So even that bowel that you had, that was the intussusceptum that went in, because it's been impacted by this bowel that's getting engorged and edematous, it's compressing on the blood supply to this. So the mucosa doesn't get blood supply, it's what sheds off and comes as the red current jelly stools. If you do not basically go in to deal with this, then now that's when you're going to have the necrosis, the gangrene, the perforation, the whole process going in. So red current jelly stools are a lead sign. Usually the first thing that will be is that colicky abdominal pain. That's going to be the first thing. Then you'll have your vomiting coming in. Um, some kids, if you pick them early, you don't have the stools coming in. So don't wait for red current jelly stools to say, this is a child with intussusception. That colicky pain should just trigger you off. Mother saying, ah, flexes the limbs and is holding, and then all of a sudden is playing. Flexes, at that point in time, they might still have their diarrhea from rotavirus. It has a jet turned bloody. That should trigger you. This is intussusception pain. So go ahead and get your ultrasound. Don't wait for the red current jelly stools. So differentiating dysentery from um, intussusception, I think the answer is self-explanatory. But just in case it wasn't, this is a lead sign. So your dysentery patient is probably not going to come with our colicky abdominal pain. The classic is doing it. For them, the dysentery, it comes like it has come. With it, it has just come in full blown. Well, for intersusception, it's basically a spectrum. There's going to be a story that they are basically going to tell people. I hope that answers the question. I think that, I mean, I, I look, we're just about out of time, but I think one thing that probably would help a lot of the folks on the phone and the Zoom is, is if they have a child that they're worried about, how do they get a hold of you or or the, your colleagues in terms of getting that kind of expertise that you really can provide? Oh, sure. We don't have any issues sharing numbers. I can share my number in the chat. I have no problems with that. That's Great. very okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's it for the Q&A discussion sessions. And the next uh, item will be the post test, unless there are burning issues. There are always burning issues. <laughs> so.
the post test will be projected as Dr. Stella has shared her number in the chat, you can find it there right now. The post test. I think Dr. Thomas and Dr. Abraham. Now we can have the closing remarks. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this. Uh, session on emergency management of acute abdominal pain in children. It was the 39th of our echo, echo sessions that uh, always take place twice, I mean, takes every after two weeks on Fridays at 2 p.m. And the link is always shared. Uh, thank you for being an attentive audience. And uh, also, I wish you a happy Heroes Day. If you have any other communications, this is the time to pass them on briefly. Uh, thank you, Elias, the moderator, uh, for today's session. It was a wonderful session. I think participants, uh, we should continue appreciating our experts. They did a great job. Uh, I am seeing uh, we have Professor James Tumwine is attending the session. I think Professor could give us a word uh, in this session because most of us have been uh, professor students. Professor, are you able to give us a word? Yes, I am. I'm so glad to attend this excellent session. So um, thank you very much for, for it. Um, we don't stop learning until we are six feet under. So that's why I'm attending, because um, the last one year alone, we have had five patients with interception, and they first land on our ward, on the pediatric ward. And I'm so glad that uh, our master's students were able to pick all the five using the basic training we are giving them. So I really want to thank you, and uh, let's continue. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. We are proud of you. We are happy that you've taught most of us. And thank you for carrying on the same to Kavala University. Uh, to our uh, panelists, I don't know if we have any closing remarks. We could begin with uh, uh, Sister Alice, and then we go around up to Dr. Harry, and then Dr. Jambo will give the last uh, closing remarks. Before we take session screenshots, we have to remember this session because it was on Heroes Day. Everyone who attended today is a hero. You should be demand for your medal from somewhere. I don't know, but you are a hero. Okay, it's true. Uh, sister, you're closing the mic. Okay, thank you so much. I will thank the presenters and the anchor team for this opportunity. Dr. Stella, thank you for informing me. It has been really a good session and I've really learned a lot. I have added really a lot to what I had. Hope also my fellow nurses have benefited a lot from this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sister. Uh, Dr. Stella. Um, I think for me, my closing remarks would be um, acute abdomen can be overwhelming in children there's so many things to consider like we had talked about so just be systematic it, it's if you basically go haphazard chances are you're going to miss something along the way so keep it systematic but also don't forget you can always ask for help and that's the most important thing you don't have to do it on your own so just be systematic and ask for help there's no crime in that Thank you, Dr. Stella. Um, we have a session recording. We are going to upload to our YouTube channel. So those that miss any components, they can uh, get uh, to review the session. Uh, Dr. Musinje. Yes, thank you everyone for attending and to the fellow panelists. Um, I think uh, there are very many take-home points from here, apart from teamwork, 
but also continued uh, resuscitation of the patient pre-op, intra-op, and even the post-op period, which I uh, think we should all remember and uh, keep practicing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Busenje. Uh, Dr. Harry, Yes, um, so thank you all uh, for joining us. I, I have to say, just like the professor, um, I learned a lot today. Um, and um, even with all this gray hair, I learned a lot. And so I appreciate um, Dr. Stella and the other um, uh, panelists uh, for really providing us um, really important information. Uh, and as, as Dr. Stella says, there's a whole, there's a, really a lot of things that could be related to acute abdominal pain. And I think it's up to you to both resuscitate um, those patients, but also approach the problem systematically to try to um, uh, fit that right age and the symptoms and their exam and the, and the investigations with what, what the test, what, what the condition could be. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Henry, for those awards. Uh, Dr. Jambo, you had the last to give us your closing remarks as we prepare to take uh, this National Heroes Day screenshots. Thank you very much for this uh, session. Thank you for attending, for those who have been able to attend. And um, I, I encourage us to continue at having these sessions and attending them. I also encourage us to uh, use the skills we have obtained to easily identify uh, the children with uh, with intestinal obstruction, most uh, commonly interception, which is very common among our our children, so that we can uh, uh, manage them when it's still early and save their lives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Doctor Ajambo. Uh, you made a wonderful patient case. Uh, thank you, Team Kavale. We look forward to getting more cases and experts from uh, Kavale General Referral and uh, Kavale University. Uh, before we close, we want to tell you the results from our post uh, our post test. Uh, we want to know uh, which ones were the right answers and which ones were the wrong answers and what are the reasons for that. Uh, as we prepare that, would uh, we are asking you to put on your videos as you respond also to the general assessment. We want you to rank how the session was so we can know where to improve so give a, a genuine response to the to the polls that are doing gen assessment as we prepare to present the results uh, any any participant with any comment at this moment you are happy to unmute and give us a comment someone should tell us what they learned most I can pick randomly today, since it's a hero zero and it's a hero. I can pick randomly uh, who is going to give us uh, what they learned. I can begin from Angusi Abdu. Are you able to tell us what you learned today? Please, uh, if I pick on you randomly, please do not disappear. <laughs> Okay, any volunteer to tell us what you learned today? Feel free to tell us what you learned today. <laughs> yes, Joseph Amania, are you going to tell us? Uh, thank you so much, guys, and thank you, the Echo. Uh, possibly more I learned about. Uh, secondly, uh, and uh, it's probably as far as when to do surgery and uh, how to manage. I learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, Amanya, we can barely hear you, but thank you at least for being the, the most hero among the heroes today to tell us what you learned. Uh, so we are now sharing the polls. 
I hope everyone can see the, the whole project, project on your screens. So as we went through them at the start, the first question was saying what is the typical age group in which we see interception? And the majority of the people got it right. Um, it was uh, option B, which was children between two months to five years. The few, uh, which was 8%, chose neonates. Uh, but I hope you are all educated today. For those, for those, for 80 percent and the other percent that didn't choose 87, you can continue to watch the, the session recording on YouTube. Um, number two was the following are the nursing interventions for a child with a snow obstruction except. Uh, we also, uh, for this, uh, also the percent, uh, the percent of 79 percent chose the right answer, which was isolating the child to uh, prevent the spread of infection. Uh, no, this is the wrong answer. I choose to believe that as maybe chose the other options, not having read the question very well. Um, then the third one was, which is the first symptom in a child to do the reconstruction? And 71% uh, chose colic abdominal pain, which was the right answer. Uh, in the pretest, uh, a bigger percentage they have chosen red current jelly stools, but Dr. Stella has uh, invited on that. So, glad to see that there is an increase in the people who were educated today. So, the, the fourth question on the <laughs> which of the uh, imaging modality of choice in making the diagnosis of intestinal solution? And uh, majority, which was 73%, chose abdominal results scan. Which was the right answer in this case. Um, uh, the pastor also noted this in, in the presentation that the pain uh, erythroderma X-ray may be important for some other forms of I, causes of I.O. But for this case, abdominal ultrasound scan is the best. So thank you for all who answered the polls. Um, back to my colleague Thomas. Uh, thank you so much, Impra. So the results of the polls and. Uh, the reason why some the answers are right and others are wrong, they will be uploaded to our website. So we are requesting that you put on your cameras and you take screenshots. These screenshots are posted on the website. Uh, if you haven't seen the recent screenshots, because we are continuously updating our website, we are going to load all the screenshots and you can share them on email for those that request for them. I am happy to see those of you who have continuously attended sessions. Uh, thank you for attending ECHO sessions. And we ask that you spread that information to others so that in the case that you are the patient, there's someone to treat you. Because you, you will not always be the doctor. There might be a moment when you are the patient. So it is important that all of us learn from these eco sessions. Uh, okay, so it was nice seeing all of you. I want to wish you a happy weekend. Uh, there are two. Uh, those of you in Kampala, we have two concerts. Those <laughs> 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 <laugh